Robin Sather has a secret. It's the early 2000s, and Sather is in his 50s. But every birthday and Christmas since he was four years old, he's asked for the same gift. Legos. As Sather's gotten older, his love for the little plastic bricks hasn't faded like it does for most kids. He's actually a little embarrassed about it. He figures he's probably the only adult in the world who's still into Legos. But as he researches old Lego models online, he starts to realize he's not alone. Not even close. There's even a name for people like him, AFOLs, adult fans of Lego. Over time, Sather connects with some of those AFOLs online, and the uncomfortable secret turns to pride. He even takes on a leadership role as the co-founder of the Vancouver Lego Club. I've done almost anything. I've dinosaurs, trains, uh, cats. I'm big, building a dog next week. Castles, um, giant shopping baskets. Wow. Uh, but while Robin Sather's future with Lego feels full of possibility, a Danish businessman named Kjeld Kirk Christensen sees dark clouds on the horizon. Christensen is Lego's owner and chairman, and he's got a problem. The 70-year-old company has just posted its biggest loss ever. The business his grandfather started is at risk of going under. Enter a 30-something consultant named Jorgen Vignudstorp. In 2004, he takes over as CEO, the first from outside the family. It's a golden rule in business that most companies don't die from starvation. They, do, they die from indigestion uh, because there's so much opportunity if you start opening your eyes to it. Nude Stewart makes changes. He cuts staff and sells off side businesses, things any new CEO would do. But he also does something else. He starts attending Lego events organized by fans themselves. In 2005, he goes to a meeting called BrickFest and sees firsthand how fan communities are booming. And he sees how some of the most ardent fans aren't kids at all. They're adults like Robin Sather. They're finding each other, sharing their creations, and even though they make up just 5% of LEGO customers, they're outspending kids by a factor of 20 to 1. Nudstorp sees an opportunity. LEGO hires a community manager to engage super users, like Adam Reed Tucker in Chicago. For me, being an architect and using LEGO bricks is, is really kind of interesting because the building bricks of LEGO and the building bricks of real architecture are not too dissimilar. Tucker's passion for recreating famous buildings leads the company to launch the Lego architecture line. Then they create an online ambassador network to recognize their most talented builders. Robin Sather gets the title Lego Certified Professional. Finally, the company develops an online system to crowdsource creations from superfans, allowing them to vote on ideas. The best ideas become new products. Tapping into their adult users and giving them more influence helps fuel a dramatic turnaround. By 2018, LEGO is worth $7.5 billion, making it the world's most valuable toy brand. Which leads to the question, what does the LEGO story tell us about the changing nature of power? From LinkedIn News, I'm Leah Smart, and this is Everyday Better. Join me every week to explore the stories and ideas that show us how we can live even better every single day with people who are changing the world. Tune in to my weekly podcast, Every Day Better, wherever you like to listen. From Wondery, I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Each week, we bring you one idea with the power to change the way you see the world. This week, upending old models of leadership and power. The Lego story you just heard is from a book called New Power, how Power Works in Our Hyperconnected World, and How to Make It Work for You. It was written by Henry Timms and Jeremy Hymans. New power is the idea that connected crowds are changing our businesses, our culture, and even our politics at least as much as traditional corporate titans or political leaders. Timms and Hymans say Lego's willingness to give some control to their customers is a great example of how to tap into it. Timms is CEO of Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. 
Before taking the job, he ran the 92nd Street Y, a renowned cultural and community center. He's also the founder of Giving Tuesday, which has raised more than a billion dollars for charities and other causes. Tim spoke with our next big idea curator and best-selling author, Daniel Pink, at a studio in Lower Manhattan. I want to talk about new power, but first I want to talk about Giving Tuesday. That's an idea that you came up with, and it exemplifies a lot of the principles that you and Jeremy write about in this book. Tell us where that idea came from and what it means. So I I guess it was about six years ago, and we were thinking, you know about Black Friday, and you know about Cyber Monday, these two kind of like, um, these two kind of bacchanals Mm -hmm. of consumerism. And then you would see these shots of people lining up outside uh, shopping malls and fighting over flat screen TVs. Right. And so we thought, could you reverse the trend? Rather than these two kind of national celebrations of consumption, could you create something about philanthropy and compassion? And so Giving Tuesday was a simple idea. On the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, encourage everyone everywhere to find a way to give. And so that was the genesis of Giving Tuesday. And it now it's now in 100 countries around the world. So it worked, but why? Why did it work? So we, we designed Giving Tuesday in a, in a new power way. Okay. So you think about if you were starting a campaign like Giving Tuesday in the old power world, okay. here's what you would do. You would say, it's the Giving Tuesday brought to you by the 92nd Street Y, which is the organization that, uh, that I run. Uh-huh. We would say, you have to do it in the following three ways. We would say, you have to do it on this particular day, uh-huh. and you have to centralize all of the money so it flows through us. That okay. would be the old power prescription. Right. But we did none of those things. So we took our brand off it. We never branded it. Giving Tuesday, uh, 92nd Street Wise Giving Tuesday, we okay. let, let the brand be free. Okay. And we encourage people not to do things the same way, like a franchise, but to take Giving Tuesday and to turn it into whatever it needed to grow and become. So sure. I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. The, the, the organization Dress for Success, who helped women get back into the workplace, organized Giving Shoes Day, which okay. was a day of donating shoes for women going back right. into the workplace. The University of Michigan, uh, Organize Giving Blue Day. Uh, Go Blue is what you say when you talk about the University of Michigan. Believe believe. me, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I know that. You know about this. I went went there once and just said Go Blue a lot, and I was very popular. So, (laughs) so, so, so Giving Giving Blue Day, and they raised last year over 5.4 million dollars from their community. Now, in the old power world, if someone took your brand and then changed it into something new, uh, you would do this straight away. You would say cease and desist. Right? This call the lawyers. Um, in the new power world, what you're trying to do is create brands that start moving. One of the things Jeremy and I talk about a lot in the book is it's only a movement if it moves without you. And what we're trying to do now in the new power world, whether you're selling clothes or whether you're running a local business, we're all trying to work out these dynamics of how you build movements. And, and that's what Giving Tuesday uh, has done and, and is now in 100 countries around the world. One of the interesting questions in this book is, it, is a question of who's in control. And, and I think as a founder, what you're doing in some sense is relinquishing control to the participants. Is that an accurate way to put it? I think it's more that you're thinking differently about control. One of the ways that we tend to cast, look, everyone sees these crowds bubbling up and we all know we've got to deal with them. Right. And sometimes we cast this as you can have two things in life. You can have complete control uh-huh. or complete anarchy. There's a middle ground. And that's what the book tries to do. The book right. says, look, this isn't about giving up control. It's about thinking very differently about control. So one of the metaphors I like in the book is, is the following. When you talk about old power, you refer to old power as a currency. And when you talk about new power, you refer to it as a current. Explain that. So look, an example which is vivid in all our minds right now, I think about Harvey Weinstein, right? It's kind of the ultimate example of old power as a currency. He, he hoarded up all of this power. Uh, he could spend it down when he chose. He could um, start careers, stop careers, start movies, stop movies, keep things, keep rumors padded down. There was an a, a, a amazing bit of research that we came across that the, the only person thanked as many times from the Oscars stage was God. But then, of course, Weinstein's old power empire comes crashing down. The New York Times reporting allegations by numerous women who say the Hollywood mogul sexually harassed them. His alleged victims over nearly three decades include stars like Ashley Judd and Rose McGowan. Hollywood reels at the news. It's a mix of shock and outrage and a sense that it's about time. Harvey Weinstein's behavior toward actresses and toward young women was joked about repeatedly, openly, like on TV shows and when they were announcing the Oscar nominations. Congratulations, you five ladies no longer have to pretend to be attracted to Harvey Weinstein. The allegations keep coming. Within three days of the Times article, Weinstein is fired by his own company. 
Within two weeks, he's kicked out of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Producers Guild. Seven months later, he turns himself into the police. It might have ended there with him. A massive story, but a story we're familiar with. A Hollywood power player brought down by scandal. But that's not what happened. Within days of the Weinstein revelations, actress Alyssa Milano takes to Twitter and shares the hashtag MeToo, originally created by activist Tarana Burke, to encourage more women to tell their stories of sexual harassment and assault. The hashtag goes viral. Within 48 hours, there are almost a million MeToo tweets showing up on countless feeds. Over the course of the next year, the MeToo movement brings down more than 200 powerful men. Henry Tim says it's a perfect example of new power. Think about the Me Too movement. Now, the Me Too movement, uh, which was started by Tarana Burke and then has now spread all around the world, the Me Too movement is power as a current. It flows, it's made by many, it surges, it changes. You see, when Me Too gets to France, it changes into denounce your pig. That's the framing of the campaign. So even, even the central frame itself is able to be owned by more, more people. And that's what, that's what New Power is about. It's about these distributed, made by many, much less kind of leader-focused, peer-driven models. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Harvey Weinstein versus Me Too uh, mm-hmm. brings that alive. Follow the chain of, sort of intellectual history of these ideas, because we've heard a lot about open beats closed. Yeah. Network beats hierarchical, but you're trying to take that conversation further. How have you done that? And give us, give us some examples of that. Well, I think that these dynamics have existed forever, right? They have always been top down and uh-huh. bottom up movements, they've always been hierarchies and networks. But there are some things which are very distinct to our age. Yeah. So, my, my co author, Jeremy, he, uh, he's an activist, right? So, he, he, he co founded things like Avaz and uh, All Out and uh, Get Up in Australia. And as a teenager, he was trying to stop the Iraq war. He was very precocious in this way. He's trying to stop the Iraq war. And the way he does that, he's in, he's in Australia, is he gets a fax machine. He gets his parents' fax machine. And he sends faxes to the hotels around the world of where these various world leaders are staying okay. with these missives trying to persuade them that it's a good idea to stop the Iraq war. Right? That, those were his means of participation. That was his capacity to engage with the world. At the same time he was doing that, I remember I was growing up in England and I often wanted to have my voice heard in the world. And I remember sitting on my parents' stairs on the second step, dialing again and again to our local radio station, hoping to get on so I could express my opinion, never getting on, which to be fair, I think was a saving grace for the, for the <laughs> listeners of Radio Devon. So you know, I, I don't think that was a big loss of society, but, but, but you think about both of us in our teenage years, we had these very limited means of participation. Cut forward to something like the Parkland kids yeah. right now, these, yeah. t- these teenagers. Yeah. They've started a movement which has gone uh, around the world. It, it's sped a, the, a speed to it. There's been a scale to it. There's yeah. been a kind of cr- a cross-sectoral nature of it. Right. And what's different in the age of new power is that all the, the human dynamics are there and have been there forever. But we have on our hands these tools of connection, which, which really are changing the nature of these things. And those tools of connection are social media? Social media, iPhones, connectivity, blockchain, augmented reality, virtual reality, the kind of the, the artillery of, of new technology all of which is kind of surrounding us and, and is giving us these new routes to participation. Now, I, I, we'll come on to this, that can lead to some very negative consequences, sure, yeah. but, but, but that is what's different now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so let's think about other institutions here and, and you tell me where they fall in this new power, old power spectrum. Again, yeah. old power is a currency, new power is a current. Old power is about downloads, new power is about uploads. Facebook. Well, it, it both is the answer. So Facebook, terrific new power model, perhaps the best we've seen. Think about them as an engine of participation, right? right. Think what they've enabled people to do who previously could only send faxes or call radio stations, right? They've allowed us all to kind of participate, to share, to connect, to communicate. But the interesting thing about Facebook is although their model is profoundly new power, two billion people now, right, mm-hmm. who are sharing their own content and shaping right. it, their, their value system is actually very old power. So, How so? You think about what Facebook, they have all of this kind of power to share, which their brand is built around. But actually, the algorithm is hidden. It makes all these decisions which change, change your decisions, change my decisions, shape right. our lives, shape our elections right. in a meaningful way. The governance of Facebook is quite shrouded, right? It's, it's very heavily owned by a small number of people who have a lot of control over it. And Mark Zuckerberg isn't going to make the same mistake Steve Jobs did and get ousted from his own 
company. And the value creation is extracted. Like all of the participation that you and I are engaging on Facebook, uh, we're contributing our data. Uh-huh. That data is being monetized. That money uh-huh. is going somewhere other than to us. Right. So Facebook has this really interesting challenge now, which has become very clear in the public realm, which is people have developed this political consciousness that they've realized, particularly recently, that we are all part of this new power machine, but all of our power is actually heading somewhere very different and out of our hands. And, and so the question for Facebook going ahead is, can they persuade us and can we be persuaded that they're actually making people more powerful? Because their pitch forever has been about giving people power. Is that actually what's happening is the question I think that's playing out right now. What about Twitter? So I think Twitter's really interesting and, and they're in an interesting challenge too. I think very new power, very new power model, clearly, right, that they're able to give people the chance to broadcast themselves and, and to engage. And if you, again, go back to us as teenagers, right, Twitter would have been the first place we would have gone to. Uh, th- their model is interesting. Investors are always dissatisfied with Twitter because it's not making enough money. But actually, if you think about what they're doing in the world of ideas, there are some very positive things coming out of Twitter. That The issue that they have now is dealing with the very negative side of new power, which is Twitter again and again. Which is? Well, I think particularly in which you can spread things like hate. There's some interesting data which just came out recently from the Anti-Defamation League about anti-Semitic tweets. And it's in the millions. I mean, millions of individual tweets. And those millions of tweets are being shared millions of times. Uh So there becomes this really interesting moment where, uh, and threatening moment where the tools democratize, which I put in heavy quotes, they democratize people's access to ideas. uh, And that brings with it some extremes that none of us can feel very comfortable about right. spreading. So I think Twitter is, is Twitter has the same compromise problem that Facebook has, I think to a lesser degree. I think Twitter, for what it's worth, also has developed more of a, a cultural connection with its users, particularly its super users, which, which Facebook hasn't managed to do. Right. Let me give you a two-part one. Okay. Uber yeah. and Lyft. Who's newer power? It's <laughs> uh, the same model. But the way they think about culture, I think, is slightly different. So Uber has kind of almost seems to have gone out of its way to find ways of coming into conflict with its world, right? When, when the delete Uber movement rose up, its drivers weren't on its side, its riders weren't on its side, the media wasn't on its side, influencers weren't on its side. They had right. no uh, community they had built around this amazing tool, right? Now, what, what Lyft is doing, I think, more successfully than Uber, is they are building more of a new power community around a new power tool. So there's a, there's a moment where Uber's having another price, another price decrease. Now, Price decrease is terrific for us as riders. They're awful for drivers. So, so some, well, it depends on the elasticity of demand. Well, yeah, no, all right. That, well, this is the this is the yeah. arg- argument that Uber made. So yeah. fri- Friday night, Uber just sends text to all their drivers saying we've cut prices. Right, uh-huh. that's it. We've cut prices, and and they say, and this is good for you. Right, the, 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 great news. Right. Great news. It used to be forty-seven bucks to get to JFK. Right. It's now thirty-five, and right. here's how you'll do better. Right. Drivers weren't immediately enthusiastic about that argument. So they, they issue this by fiat via text to their drivers. Their drivers uh, are upset about this. Lyft know in this moment they've got to reduce prices too. They've been in this situation before. They know if they don't meet Uber's demand, they'll fall behind. But they also know this is going to hurt their drivers. So what Lyft does in that moment is actually reach out to their driver base. They organize a bunch of events with their drivers to help the drivers themselves come up with ideas for how they could help mitigate the challenges of a lower price point. And they lean into building a community around the tool. And, and if you want a prediction, that the, the platforms and new power models who are gonna work out best in the long term will ally a new power model with new power values. Okay. What Facebook's done at the extreme is got that really badly aligned. Lyft is doing it better, Airbnb is doing it better. None of them are doing it perfectly. Um, I, I want to make that point that I don't think this is kind of, uh, you know, Lyft is good, Facebook is bad. I yeah. think this is a spectrum. Yeah. Um, but the really interesting question is actually will be different models. The, the, where, where this gets really interesting right. in, is, are there actually models that can be completely different in terms of how the value is shared? Because uh-huh. that's where things might get interesting. So new power techniques have made companies like Airbnb and Lyft billions of dollars. But what can they do for us? Hey you, I'm Andrew Seaman. Do you want a new job? Or do you want to move forward in your career? Well, you should listen to my weekly show called Get Hired with Andrew Seaman. We talk about it all. And it's waiting for you, yes you, wherever you get your podcasts. (laughs) 
If you have thoughts about what you're hearing today on the show or any ideas we explore on the podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Join the conversation with me and many of the authors featured on this podcast at nextbigideaclub.com. It's a Friday afternoon in November 2012. You're an English college student, and you've just finished your last class for the week. On your way to your apartment, you get a text. It's a video from your friend. He's wearing a green hoodie. The video follows him as he carefully carries a full glass of beer out his front door and into his low-rise apartment complex. He walks to his neighbor's door and rings the bell. <laughs> Hi, good night. Hello. When she opens, he silently downs the entire beer, then turns to the camera. I nominate you, Jelly. <laughs> Sorry about that. You've just been neck and nominated. It's a digital drinking game for millennials where you chug a beer on video, nominate a friend to do the same thing, and then upload it to the web. It's all the rage for a year or two. Man, this is a stupid challenge. I can't believe this. A couple years later, someone forwards you a viral video posted by an American woman named Jessica Legal. It's a cold water challenge. A new fad based on the neck and nominate model. Okay, I challenge um, Greg and Kelly. I challenge. You have to say her last name. Renza. I challenge Matt and Rebecca Walker. If you get nominated, you have to donate money to a cause, then jump into a cold body of water and nominate someone else. If you don't jump, you have to pay more. In this case, the cause is an evangelical mission to Africa. <laughs> Pretty soon, people all over the world are issuing similar challenges to raise money for everything from cancer treatments to fire trucks. Then comes the challenge heard round the world. All right, I've been officially called out by John Bullis in the Ice Bucket Challenge. In return, I'm calling out Jeanette Sinertia, Matt Dodson, and Kevin Allen. You have 24 hours to respond, or you're going to donate $100 to the ALS Foundation. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the Ice Bucket Challenge is launched by a semi-professional golfer named Chris Kennedy. Between June and September 2014, more than 17 million Ice Bucket videos are shared on Facebook alone. In just one summer, the ALS Association raises $115 million, four times its annual budget. So how did a silly drinking game morph into this? New Power author Henry Timms tells Daniel Pink it had three special qualities. He even has an acronym for it. ACE, so actionable, connected, and extensible. Those are the three qualities. If you want your idea, we use this phrase a lot, to spread sideways. Right. So in the old power world, your idea, you dropped ideas down. They were right. top down and everyone remembered them, right? right? So it was like the sound by era. Right. In a new power era, you want ideas that are gonna spread, right? That's how they propagate. And if, you, and if, if they're gonna spread, you need to ask people to do something actionable. They need to connect people to their peers and to a higher purpose, uh -huh. connected. Okay. And they need to be extensible. They need to be able to change to something else. So, so take the Me Too movement. Me Too movement, actionable, right? You're doing right. something. You're saying, Me Too, these you know, women all around the world were prepared to step forward and, 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 and share their testimonies. Right. Connected, it connected you to a peer group. Everyone who shared their Me, Me Too story made everyone else's story more powerful, right. right? Those collective testimonies spread sideways. Even the very phrase is in some ways magnetic. It's like me too and you adhere to someone else. hundred yeah. percent right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, it's it, it, me too. It's adding, it's, it's, it's an ellipsis, right? Yeah. It adds and it adds and it adds. So it's very connected both to a cause and to other women. And it was extensible. So it was able to turn into something else. So the example earlier, it, it changes around the world. Where, whatever country it's in, the frame itself can change, but the spirit remains. And I think that's the important insight here is that if you're looking to spread your ideas, you're running a local business. Is it actionable? Are you asking people to do something? Are you connecting them to peers who feel excited too? Uh -huh. And is it able to change into something else? Those are the three qualities you need. Right, okay. So let's, let's talk about this at the, at the unit of one. How can I use some of these principles of, of new power? Again, this idea that it's a current, not a currency, that what you want is you want people, you want your participants to actually create and construct rather than simply to comply, that you wanna have people uploading rather than merely downloading. How can I take these principles and become a better leader? So I think the place to start is to think about what you're inviting people to do. 
we, we, we all in our lives, you know, have constituencies. We want to build communities. And increasingly, there are more people who could be part of those communities. We will have access to many more people. If all you're asking them to do is to admire your work or to validate you, you're right. never going to get very far. Well, you know, in the old power world, that's what we did, right? We asked people to comply and to consume products. The question is how you build them up to ask them to do more in their lives. So think about how are you asking people to share your message? Not just your message, but actually shape it themselves, turn it into something new. Right. How do you create other people who can own your message to take it and, and, and move it and bring it somewhere else? How can you allow them a real sense that this is their idea, not just yours? Exactly. So Giving Tuesday is a good example yeah. of that, right? So the people who run Giving Tuesday at the University of Michigan, the whole community there has as high an ownership stake in that idea as we do, right? We started that idea, but the reason it spread is because we were genuinely committed to the idea of other people owning that idea. Um, often in the old power world, what we mean when we talk about wanting our ideas to spread or starting a movement is we mean we just want more fans. <laughs> we, want, we want even more people to admire us or to, or to buy our product. But are we really prepared to, to, to give some space up and let other people dig in? That, that, I think, is the key question. Let's say I'm starting a business, all right? How do I fold in these principles into the design of my business, into my very business plan? Well, from a business perspective, I think one one piece of work that we were very focused on the idea was how money is flowing differently. So how do people think about transactions? So in the, in the new power world, we have this idea of the participation premium, which says if you want to get people engaged in your product, your products need to have three key elements to them. Um, one, it needs to be a great product, so it's an economic transaction. You, you, sell, you sell a great product. Two, it needs to have a kind of altruistic sense to it. You need to feel like you're part of a community by being a part of that product. And then three, you need to create ways in which people can then actually come into this and bring their own ideas to the table. So there's this incredible story that, that we learned about in the book of a game called Star Citizen, right? So this, this is a video game. So this is essentially a startup. He's got this video game, and this, this famous game designer who's disappeared for 10 years comes back and he says, I'm going to save the PC game. This is the age of kind of Angry Birds and Candy Crush, and people have stopped playing PC games. I'm going to save this game. He can't get any money from, from traditional backers. He goes to the crowd and says, help me back this game. Let's co-create this universe together called Star Citizen. And he says to all these fans, look, we can imagine what it could be like, what your ships could be like. They had a lot of message boards early on, a lot of fan fiction, a lot of kind of creativity. Fans start creating their own radio stations, and they start raising all of this money. So very quickly, they get $3 million, which is pretty good for, for a game that they thought they only needed two to make it. But they keep raising money. They get to $15 million. They keep raising money. They then say to their fans, why don't you buy ships for this future world? Buy a ship now, and then when this game exists, you'll have a ship in your hangar. So they start buying conceptual ships that will eventually exist when this game is released. Mm -hmm. They get to sort of like Tesla. It, yeah, right. It's, it's, it, it actually, there are some real, there are some real similarities with Tesla. Um, a cheaper price point, but they so they get this point. This and eventually they've raised seventy-five million dollars. They hire Luke Skywalker and um, uh, Mark Hamill and, and Gillian Anderson for the X Wild to voice over the characters. They they create new symphonies. They create new languages. It's, and that's almost two hundred million dollars now raised for this game, and the game still doesn't exist. Uh -huh. This is now it's now three or four years late, and there's this community of people out there who have, have seen huge value, and obviously a lot of people think this is a Ponzi scheme, but actually when you talk to some of the people inside this world, they're seeing huge value created already because they have this real sense of purpose, they're part of something, they're part of building this amazing cause, this amazing cause they've built around a video game, and they feel like they genuinely can shape the product. They feel like they're part of this world being right. created. And so if you're starting a small business, you look at a story like that and you can either think, well, this is just crazy video game stories, or you can think there are some lessons in this which, which can help me, which is whatever your product is, can you connect it to a higher peer community and purpose? Okay. And whatever your product is, how are you creating people, how are you giving people real ways they can get their hands on it and really shape it themselves? And, and that is about giving up some control. The decision to transform Neck and Nominate from a drinking game to a multi-million dollar fundraising tool wasn't made in a boardroom. The game's originators didn't know it at the time, but their idea had all the elements it needed to become something bigger and more meaningful. And its evolution may have something to teach us about our public life. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. 
Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z General Partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. It's the spring of 2016. A British maritime research team decides to ask the public to help name its newest vessel. Sounds innocuous enough, right? Even kind of new power cool. But what unfolds is a culture clash of epic proportions. Henry Timms tells Next Big Idea curator Daniel Pink why it didn't work. So this is kind of how to get new power wrong uh, 101. So there's a British research agency who have got this new boat. They've got $300 million that they're spending on an Arctic explorer. Terrific, right? And, yeah. and so they're, 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 they've just started the contract. They're going to build this boat. And they think to themselves, quite rightly, we ought to en- engage the crowd. So let's, and, and this is when it goes wrong, let's ask them to hashtag name our ship. Okay. Now. Seems very new power. Seems like a great idea. So far, We're you, giving up yeah. control. It's great. We're allowing people to it's, participate. We're having them upload rather than download. Oh, so far, so perfect. It sounds great, Henry, but what happened? Well, things start, here's the first sign things may not work out terrifically well. They launched this campaign via press release, which is the first signal that things might not work out great. And they say in the press release, help us name our ship, Perhaps you'd like to call it something like Shackleton oh, or, or Endeavor uh-huh. or Adventurer. Okay. Those aren't the kinds of names the crowd comes back with. So no, within, no, no. And that violates this idea that you want to encourage participation. This is the, well, they do want to encourage participation. They do, but they want it. But, but in some ways, that box is too tightly defined. They, do, they would just really like the crowd to decide Shackleton is a good name. Yeah. That's, that's the dream <laughs> scenario here. Um, the crowd thinks very differently about this. So within, within, within uh, days, uh, the surging favorite name is, is Boaty McBoatface. Sure. And Boaty McBoatface isn't just a bit popular, it's, it's epically popular. It's popular everywhere, it's in all the newspapers. Although in 10th place, and I think this was very badly overlooked, was I like big boats and I cannot lie, which I really thought should have done much better. In any case, they, it goes viral, it's everywhere, it's in all the pubs, it's on the TV shows, it's in all the newspapers, it goes across the world. The New York Times covers it, CNN covers it. And it leads to a real problem for this scientific agency because the science minister is like, you're trivializing science. This is, right. We're spending $300 million. This, yeah. everyone's la- this is a laughing stock. Yeah. And in a very British way, they actually have a parliamentary inquiry at the end of, of this, obviously. And there are these three politicians looking down on the guy who runs this agency, who's brought with him a scientist as a kind of an advisor to help defend him. And the, the, the advisor's doing a very good job of defending this campaign and saying, actually, you know, we learned some stuff from this. And then one of the politicians says to the advisor, uh, so who was it you voted for? And he looks a bit sadly and very quietly says, Boaty Mo- Oh, man, <laughs> oh man. So even the advisor. But anyway, so the, 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 the end of the story is they give up on Boaty McVote face. They call it Sir David Attenborough, who's this famous British sure who's um, in, in the autumn of his life and everyone loves and no one could complain. And they, and they, Boaty becomes a submarine on the ship. And so they literally sink Boaty at sea. Now, if they had been true to this, you think about, they gave up on perhaps, this was the single moment of biggest public interest in maritime science of the modern day, yes. right? And they let it walk away. And the reason they did that is they thought it was a bit silly. Um, it's not much sillier than, than Beagle or Golden Hind, right? There's a long tradition of, of, of right. somewhat silly boat names. But they gave it up because they weren't prepared to think strategically about the crowd. In this scientific, in this inquiry at the end of it, the critique was, um, you know, the internet is trivializing science. Uh-huh. But actually what happened here is that the science trivialized the internet. They didn't really want the crowd engaged. They weren't right. really prepared to give up any control. They hadn't thought carefully about it. Right. They just kind of lurched at the crowd right. and assumed something good would happen. In their book, Tim's and Hyman's talk a lot about leadership in a new power world. It's not just about learning to use new tools. It's also about having the courage to change how organizations are structured. For leaders steeped in old power thinking, that can be a heavy lift. Can the impetus for change come from somewhere else? How do I take these ideas into the workplace if I'm not in charge? Right. I'm just a, you know, I'm working at a 20 person yeah. a design firm or insurance company 
and I'm not the person who is nominally in charge, what do I do with these principles? So I think there's a lot of there's a lot which can be done uh, to encourage people who are in charge to think differently. One of the things we've seen a lot with companies is the, the great archetype. A lot of companies recognize they need to change, right? That's not a new story. But they'll often bring in the disruptor. They'll bring in some person who's 27 years old, who used to work at a Facebook, who, who's going to come in. They're going to change everything. And often those people won't be successful because they won't have any legitimacy. The, the culture will be too big a clash. And they'll make a lot of people feel very left behind. If you're someone who's got a lot of ideas and you want to shift outcomes in the workplace, think about the people who are senior to you, who you can help make this shift. Because they want to shift too. They recognize all these old power skills aren't going to get them where they need to go next. But they're often feeling very threatened by the world of the crowd. They're often feeling threatened by people like you who are approaching the world with a different set of values. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would adopt a senior leader would be my advice here. Find a senior leader, adopt them, help them make a shift. And by, by making them a shift, the likelihood is they'll take them with you. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, is be prepared to experiment. I was with a, a company who, who we know quite well recently, and a really interesting story which kind of points to one of the challenges in the modern workplace. So there's a, there's a young woman there who's one of their kind of superstars, and she's in this one function. Uh, it's not a technical function. And she's in one function, and she, she's dealing with this, um, this app, which is no good. It's an internal app. It's not really working properly. She doesn't like it. So she teaches herself to code in her lunch breaks and in the evenings and creates a new app which is better than the one people have existed and puts it into the market. So suddenly you've got this person who is in a very new power way, not prepared to sit in her lane, right? right. Not prepared to just sit and be patient and wait until her time comes. Not prepared to exp express the kind of the walls of the old power world. But she's created something of amazing value to the institution, right? But that value comes at a cost that is threatening some people who have done those jobs for a long time. Right. The real question in moments like that is, how do you as a company think about that employee, right? Are you going to reject it? A lot of companies would. Not your job. Don't do it. Are you going to tolerate it? Which is okay. Look, she tried hard. Fair enough. It's a good product. Let it go. Right. Or are you going to embrace it? Right. And I think that's the question for companies is we often scold younger people right now, right? They're moving too fast. They want to do too much. They want to be promoted too quickly. They want too many jobs. I think that's quite a tired argument. The other way of thinking about that is, You've got all these people who want to do stuff. Mm -hmm. they, they want to move the needle. Your job as a leader is to make it easier for them, not to tell them to sit in line. And so I think in the workplace, if you're the boss, um, making space for people who want to upload is yeah. a really important idea. Yeah. And if you're the person who wants to upload, recognizing you can't just walk into a workplace, shout, screw you, I'm disrupting, <laughs> and, and, and assume that's going to get you to a good outcome, because it yeah. won't. You have to be sensitive to a cultural shift. Let's go back to, let's talk about this in political terms here. We talked a lot about the commercial side of it. What do Black Lives Matter and Trump's Make America Great Again movement have in common? So definitely Black Lives Matter, I think, is a terrific example of, mm -hmm. of a new power model with new power values, right? So the model itself, it's, it's surged around the world. It was started by three women, but is now uh, owned by people everywhere. Right. So terrific example of that. The way it's designed, it's grabbed, it's turned into new things, it extends, it, it is power as a current it's right. flowing around the right. world. Um, but but what, what else happens with Black Lives Matter is it genuinely makes people more powerful. They use this great phrase about how they think about leadership, which is it's not leaderless, it's leaderful. That right. actually Black Lives Matter, it, it creates right. more space for people right. to be leaders. Right. Now, what, what Trump got very right was he realized that, that people wanted more agency and more belonging, right? What, what he did well with his campaign was that people who were invested in it felt like they were given avenues to participation. And you look back at the, the favorables of Hillary and, and, and Trump, neither of them were anything to write home about, but Hillary's were always higher. So she had greater favorability, but what Trump had was greater intensity. Mm -hmm. Like what he actually, at the end of the day, he was able to get people more excited, more engaged, more outraged, and that's what swung it for him. And, and that's the lesson, I think, that that was a new power model, because Trump wasn't trying to control everything and keep it all standard and the same. The more chaos, the better, the more extreme, the better, the, the more energy, the better. Like he was trying to spread that out into the world, but of course, it all reverted back to him. Trump wasn't trying to create a leader full movement. Trump was saying, I alone can fix it. Mm -hmm. And so he surged the energy of his crowd to a very different outcome than, than Black Lives Matter. It's, it's not old power bad, new power good. Um, it is bring these two together in the right way. That's how you get the outcomes that we're looking for in the world. From, uh, from your lips to the world's ears, Henry Timms, thank you so much for being part of the Next Big Idea Club and for doing this conversation. We're, we're honored. Thank you so much.
In the spirit of Henry Tim's book, we'd like to invite you to join the new power community that we're building around life-changing ideas. It's called the Next Big Idea Club. And if you join now, we'll send you a free copy of New Power. Just go to nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast, promo code POWER. That's nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast, promo code POWER. If you like the podcast, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, NPR One, and every major listening app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes and a link to the Next Big Idea Club. A special thanks today to Daniel Pink, who conducted the interview, and to Henry Timms and his co-author, Jeremy Hymans. Their book, New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyperconnected World and How to Make It Work for You, is one of my favorites, and it's available wherever books are sold. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. This episode of The Next Big Idea was written by Austin Cross. Sound design is by Kyle Randall. Our associate producer is Caleb Bissinger. Series producers are Emma Cortland and Michael Kovdon. Our senior producer is Jonathan Miller. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.